from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We're very, very pleased to have with us for the second time Gail Tsukiyama. Born in San Francisco to a Chinese mother from Hong Kong and a Japanese father from Hawaii, Ms. Tsukiyama attended San Francisco State University, where she received both her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts degrees in English. Her finely crafted stories transport us to worlds that at first seem far removed from modern American life. Entering a Tsukiyama novel, the reader is struck by the foreignness of the setting, the exotic sounding Japanese or Chinese names, the distinct otherness of the communities she describes. Her particular, her particular storytelling magic is that she draws readers into these worlds so adeptly that soon the exotic names are familiar, the landscape's no longer foreign, and we care deeply about the fates of each character. The Washington Post calls Ms. Tsukiyama's recently published seventh novel, A Hundred Flowers, gripping, and says her writing flows with the grace of calligraphy, revealing the thoughts, motivations, and emotions of her characters with just the right strokes. Both poetic and powerful, each sentence seems to illuminate the hearts and souls of these unforgettable characters. Please welcome Gail Tsukiyama. You guys are up early. <laughs> if, if I were at home, I'd still be in my pajamas, just thinking, should I sit down and start writing? <laughs> um, I thought I would talk a little bit about everything. Um, I started this book, if, if, if you follow the seven books, that, uh, six books that have led up to this, you would know that for some reason I keep writing about China or Japan. And I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and is, I'm a typical American kid and can't quite figure out why I always write about China and Japan. Um, I, I'm of both cultures, but I was raised in the Chinese culture. My mother eventually came over to go to school. Her family all immigrated. We all grew up in the Bay Area. So I grew up here in Cantonese. I, we celebrated all the Chinese festivals and New Year's, and I knew nothing about being Japanese. Um, and I think that was probably the impetus. The first book, the book that you're not sure if you know how to write, I fell onto my Chinese culture because that's what I grew up on. And I didn't have anything to write about my own life. I didn't run with scissors. I didn't do anything that would have gotten me a, a best-selling memoir. Um, so I wrote about a group of Chinese women silk workers who survived for roughly 100 years as a subculture. Uh, and when I had finished that book, I thought to myself, now what do I write about? Uh, you know, publishing houses always think authors have that first book. We all have one book in us. It's the second book that's always the book that they wonder if this author has inside of them. And I had no idea what I wanted to write about, and I was sitting there, I, I can to this day feel that nervousness of sitting at my desk with the computer turned on but nothing on the screen, and just wondering what the next book was gonna be. And i very fortunate had a mother who always told me stories. Um, and Ma Maxine Nong Kingston calls it talk stories. So I grew up hearing all these talk stories about family, about culture, and I remembered one story about an uncle who had been ill, who had gone from Hong Kong to a small beach village called Tarumi in Japan to recuperate. And I thought to myself, I wonder if there's a book there. Um, it became the seed of what would become the fictional story, The Samurai's Garden, which is my second book. It also helped me actually learn about the Japanese culture and to understand it and to realize that I was much more Japanese than I thought, even though I didn't grow up in the culture. In terms of the simplicity, in terms of the quietness, um, the zenness, the poetry, um, in that vein, I, f I found myself much more Japanese than Chinese. So from then on, I just kept writing about one culture to the other. 
I was very fortunate to have been asked to go to China with UC Berkeley um, to speak to their alumni group about the books I had written on China. And actually, it was the first time that I had been to a lot of areas in China that I most probably all of you have already been to, like Beijing and Shanghai. I had only been to the southern part where my first book had taken place. So I thought, oh, what a lovely opportunity to get to go to China and to see places and maybe come back with a book. And so I was in Beijing, and you know how Beijing is now. It's very commercial. It's very modern. They're very capitalistic. And so I was in Beijing, and I'm thinking, where's all the old stuff? <laughs> and then had gotten taken out to the Great Wall and was totally blown away and very amazed by this wall that was built across China by I don't know how many people who probably died building it. Um, and that kind of got me on this idea that I wanted to write yet another book about China. Um, the previous book I had written was about a Japanese sumo. And, and suddenly I thought, what do I want to write about in China? And for some reason, the Cultural Revolution, which has been written about a lot, uh, popped into my mind. And I didn't want to write about the Cultural Revolution per se, but I wanted to write about something during that period of time. I'm actually trying to make my way towards modern day. Um, all the books have taken place in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and this is in the 50s. Um, I do a lot of research. I kind of have an idea, and I begin I don't use an outline. I just begin with either hearing a voice, thinking about a character, a place, you know, whatever begins this book. And for this particular book, I started it four different times, 100 pages each time, and then I gave up on it. And the only thing that stayed in each writing of it was this one scene in the very beginning of the book with the little boy falling from the tree. And it stayed, but everything else changed. Four times 100 is 400 pages. I would have had a book done already. <laughs> so you see how the process is. You never know. You, you have an idea. You have the seed. But it may not lead you where you want to lead. I keep thinking, by the seventh book, I should have it down. I should be able to sit down and write a book from beginning to end. But it only gets harder. It's more difficult. There's more people sitting on my shoulder, I feel, when I turn on the computer. I've got you. <laughs> I've got book clubs, I've got my agent, my editor, the, you know, um, and I, some, something happens. It, they, you all disappear when I begin to write. And I begin with that first line and I just start. And with this thing, I, I always had the image of the little boy falling from a tree and somehow that would kickstart the story. So I'd written that scene four times and everything else I got rid of but it stayed in the beginning of the book. Um, I started researching, and I researched the, the Cultural Revolution and realized that I didn't want to write about that. I started re researching a little bit before, and I realized that there was a time in history I didn't really know about. It was called the Hundred Flowers Campaign. Um, and it was when Mao had spent roughly about eight years after the communists had came into power, and then killed roughly 100,000 intellectuals during that period of time, and then got up and said to them, I take it back. I really want you to tell me what would make China a stronger, better country. So he opened it up to the people, and of course, this was in 1956, and nobody said a word. You know, they weren't going to fall for that. And a year, roughly a year had gone by, and nobody was saying anything. And Zhao Enlai got up, and he was the premier of China at that time, and very beloved by the people. And he had said, it's true, we really would like you to tell us what would make China a better, stronger country. And so very slowly, the door began to open. And the first people that began to make comments were the scientists who said, you know, if we had better this and better that. And then the university professor said, if we had more money for education, think what we could do. But then the door swung open, and the university students began to protests and say, well, if you didn't use all the money, if the Communist Party didn't have everything and the people have nothing, maybe it would be a stronger country. Well, within weeks, the door slammed. Um, but not before thousands of people had written letters to the Premier and to, and to Mao saying what they thought would make China a, a stronger, better country. And one of these letters comes from the family in this book. And I wanted to write a more intimate book. The last book covered 30 years 
over the war in Japan. This book is five months in one family who had written one letter and what happens when, when the wife discovers this letter and who had written it. Um, so very different process again. I thought I would read you a tiny little bit and then I would throw it open to questions because I think you have the questions, you're the readers. I love seeing so many readers. I mean, this festival is amazing because I have not seen this many people in a tent and all these tents filled with readers. It's a lovely thing, especially because we're in the midst of crossroads in the publishing world and we don't know about the book anymore the book that we hold in our hands as opposed to the books that are being downloaded now. You know, and, and it scares me when I see that, that there's more downloads being downloaded than books being bought. It's a whole different world for us as writers too. Um, the only saving grace is that I know that you still need writers to write the stories regardless of how you read them. Um, you know, we're, we're still here to write them but it's a very tenuous time now and we're all trying to find our footing. Um, but I'm gonna read you a little bit of that scene that I said stayed within the whole thing of all the rewritings at the very beginning um, so that you get a taste and then I'd like to throw it open for you to ask me questions so that I can address what you might wanna hear. Um, this book is divided into five different voices of five people who are, are in this family unit that's living in this old villa in the southern part of China in Canton. Um, and it's the little boy's named Tao and he's the one who falls from this tree. I'm watching her thinking she's working so hard. <laughs> the courtyard was still quiet so early in the morning. The neighborhood just waking as neighbor Lao's rooster began to crow. The air was already warm, a taste of the heat and humidity that would be unbearable by midday. Seven-year-old Tao knew he had little time to climb the kapok tree before he'd be discovered. He glanced down at the gnarled roots of the tree and felt strangely comforted, a reminder of the crooked ginger roots his mama sliced and boiled into strong teas for her headaches, or when his baba complained of indigestion. Tao wasn't afraid as he shimmied up the kapok tree's slender trunk toward the broad branches, avoiding thorns on the spiny offshoots of the same tree his father had climbed as a boy his heart thumping in, his, in excitement at the idea of seeing White Cloud Mountain from, high up, from up so high. For the time he was two, his father would lift him up to look out from his bedroom window or from the second story balcony as they searched for the mountain in the far distance. His Baba always told him if he looked hard enough, he could see all of Guangzhou and as far away as White Cloud Mountain on a clear day. With its 30 peaks, the mountain was a magical place for him, and his eyes watered with an effort to glimpse just the shadow of an elusive peak. Tao could still feel the rough stubble of his father's cheek against his, like the scratchy military blankets they used at school during nap time when he was younger. But last July, just before his sixth birthday, everything changed. Angry voices filled the courtyard early one morning, his father's voice rising above them all, followed by the sound of scuffling. He looked out the window to see his baba's hands bound behind his back as he was dragged away by two unsmiling policemen in drab green uniforms. He saw his grandfather push, trying to push closer to his father, only to be roughly shoved back by one of the policemen. Where are you taking him? His mother's lone voice cried out from the gate. But all he heard was the roar of the jeep, and then they were gone. After his father was taken away, when his mother and grandfather thought he was still asleep, Tao heard their low voices. But when he made his way downstairs, the whispering had stopped. He saw his mother crying and his grandfather sitting in the shadows as still as stone. He wanted them to answer all his questions. Where did Baba go? Why did those men take him away? When will he come home again? Before he could say a word, his mother pulled him toward her and hugged him. Baba had to go away for a little while, she told him. He smelled the mix of sweat and the scent of boiled herbs in her hair and on her clothes, and he blurted out, why didn't Baba tell me he had to go away? But he held tightly, but she held tightly onto him, and a strange sound came from her throat. Only then did he understand his father was really gone and his questions would remain unanswered. He squeezed his eyes shut so he couldn't see her crying. From that day on, his father was no longer there to tell him about White Cloud Mountain. 
At first, Tao was scared and confused, wanting only to feel his Baba's warmth beside him, to hear his laughter coming from the courtyard. Tao searched for his father in all the places they had gone together, down by the tree-lined canal, through the alleyways that separated the red brick apartment buildings, in and out of the crowded, narrow streets lined with restaurants, and on the small shop where his father always brought him sweets filled with red bean, rotted sesame seeds, on their way to Dongsheng Park. It was as if they were playing a game of hide-and-seek, he thought. He thought his papa would have to come out of hiding sooner or later but he never did. Mr. Lamb, the shopkeeper, brought Tal safely back home, but not before he reached up to the shelves and took down a glass jar and slipped him a piece of candy, the same sugar candy that his mother's patients often sucked on after drinking an especially bitter tea. Don't worry, your baba will be back soon, he said reassuringly. Tal nodded, but all he tasted as he sucked on the hard candy was grief. I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Are there questions? Guide me. <laughs> uh, you say that um, you write from ideas or characters or situations and not from outlines, mm -hmm. but you also say that you do a lot of research. So when you're researching though, do you take notes and outlines from that? Well, yes. I mean, I don't make outlines from that. I, what I do is I do take notes. A lot of times when I find specific areas where I'm interested, I write it down word for word, not so that I will write that in the book, but by somehow writing down what you're reading, it goes into my head so that I regurgitate it and it comes out within the story. I mean, I think the hardest part of placing fiction in real time and real events is that fact that sometimes you do so much research that the research takes over the story. So if I read and I'm actually writing down the, the facts and figures and the times and the dates and I put it down on the paper, I feel like I'm already putting it down. And so when I'm writing it within the story, it takes the back seat for me. You know, we all have our different processes. It's amazing how writers work. I mean, I have a, I have a friend who write, writes every little movement that a character is going to make in every scene, writes it on index courts, cards and places it on her back wall. And I remember seeing them and I'm I thinking, how can you do that? Because for me, I can't know where a character is going to go until they actually take that step towards it. Like one scene leads to the next scene. If I did that, it would seem stagnant to me, you know, that I would look at it and I'd say, oh, now she's got to go to the pharmacy, you know, so now I have to write that scene. And somehow it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't work as an organism for me if I do it that way. So yes, you know, it outlines in my head, but not an outline on the page. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering, what is the best advice that you got from another writer? From another writer? Well, it was probably, you know, I mean, I remembered English teachers always telling you to rewrite, and you're always being in high school hating to rewrite anything. That's all we do now is rewrite. And so I think the best advice came from the English teachers early on. You have to keep doing it till you get it right on the page, till you feel good about it, or else you're not writing the best story you can write. Um, so I think it came from an English teacher as opposed to, you know, and, and from other writers, I think we talk a lot about worrying about our readers, you know, I mean, I think it's very hard to be a writer because readers get very used to what you write and they want you to write that again and again and again in a, in a different way and if you do something slightly different, you sometimes get the wrath of your reader. You know, um, and so it's, it's, it's a tough place to be sometimes. So that's the kind of things that writers talk about, you know, um, to give you a little inside information. Um, but you know, we all, we're, we're, we all have each other's backs, you know, if you're good friends, because it's, it's a tough world, you know, and then you have the reviews come out and, and sometimes they don't understand what you're trying to do and you know, you need your friend to call you and tell you, you know, keep going forward. So thank you. Thank you.
Hello, I have two questions. Uh, yeah. You went into a little bit about how you outline in your mind. That's really great, but what about, what's your normal day? I mean, do you get up, have like 10 cups of coffee, and then go write <laughs> in your computer <laughs> over, your, over your garage? And then well, the other question is, if you have a deadline, how does yeah. that impact? Because some people have to have like pressure to get something done, so I just was curious about No, that. that's a good question. What was the first one again? No. <laughs> um, my process. I tend to be a night person. So, and actually there's, there's the left and right hand because I think a lot of writers get up very early in the morning and write. Um, and it's because of that quietness. And it's because before the emails take over, and before the phone starts ringing in, and, and Safeway has a sale, and you need to go buy things, you know. <laughs> before you can get interrupted by daily life, you have the early morning or you have the very late at night. Um, I tend, if it's a perfect day, to be sitting down at the desk anywhere between 9 and 10 in the morning and writing until, writing, I should say, trying to write until lunch, and then writing several hours after lunch. That would be a perfect day. A lot of times that doesn't happen, no. Um, and that's why the evening for me is better. From 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. is a really good time for me. Um, it's, you know, all the good TV shows are over. <laughs> I can concentrate on the book, <laughs> you know, and, and, and there's a kind of quietness late at night that's a slightly different from that quietness in the morning. So I think that's the perfect time for me when I'm on a deadline. And believe it or not, the books aren't, they don't come out like mystery books, you know, that come out every year. They come out in longer periods of time and I'm finding as the years go by, they're taking longer. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate because my editor and my publishing house, and I've been with the same house for every book. So they're very lenient about, you know, I get the little nudge like, so how are you? How's the book coming along? Uh-huh, uh-huh. When do you think you could get that to me? But you know, very <laughs> and, but so when I start hearing that, I know they want it. Um, and then I start getting that kind of nervous energy to write. And then I write pretty much around the clock. You know, then I'll write day, morning, night, um, and, and kind of trying to turn off everything. The hard part is technology has really interrupted a writer's life. Just the fact that, you know, you have to really allow yourself to step away from email and all the things that can distract you. Um, and, you know, I can be distracted easy enough because I can say, I've got to go research now, you know, and the whole day will be researching that I'm thinking, but I didn't do any writing. Oh, but researching is part of the writing, you know? So it's all the different processes that you go through, you know, and I tend to research a little bit before I begin a book if it's a place that I need to know about. And then I start writing and I research along with the writing. Yeah, so, yes. Hi. Wow, this is, this is kind of surreal right now. Um, I'm an aspiring writer uh -huh. right now, so I just wanted to ask you, in the excerpt that you read from your book, yes. you used a lot of description. Yes. And I just wanted to know how you, how you incorporated that description into, into your writing. Is it because you took those notes and you went to China and you had all those experiences? How did, how did those get? into the final copy of that, if you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I do understand what you, um, you know, my, the main goal, I always believe that a writer should do is to set the reader in time and place, especially if you're writing historical. When I first began to write, and because I wasn't writing about now, the world that I know best, I was taking points in time and places that I had never lived in um, and I wanted to be clear about it because unless I'm clear about it, I can't translate the, that same clarity to the reader. And if you're gonna read, if I want the reader to understand who these people are in a place they've never lived, in a time they've never experienced, I have to be really clear. That's why I try to lay it down when I open a book that you know where you are, you know. Um, and I think that's a writer's job, you know, that you place the reader within the place and time so that they know, they know from there on who these characters are and how they live. And that's why I spend a lot of time really thinking about it. And I want you to do that too. I mean, any world, if you're writing science fiction, 
I think it's one of the most difficult things because you're making up a world out of nowhere. Yes, you have the freedom to choose anything you want. They can live in rocks, you know, they can live in space, but you have to make that place so real that the reader understands. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Good. Could you explain for us, please, your process of research? I think research, I think you go to a library, you look at books, well, clearly there's a lot more to it than that. Is most of your research done on your computer at home, or do you go somewhere? Do I, um, both, both. Again, the technology is wonderful because if you need something right away, if I need a question answered, I can look it up right away. If I'm not quite sure, I put a question mark and I still go to the library a lot. I still like the idea of, of opening the books and reading through and taking the notes, but if I need something right away because I'm writing a scene and I don't have that time to get in the car, and if I get in the car and I go to the library, I'm gonna lose the whole effect of what I'm trying to write. So I'll look it up online and then I'll check fact check it later to make sure it's right. Because sometimes you get things on the Wikipedia, you know, you don't know if it's correct, so you have to go back and look at it again. So there's all different processes and it just depends. If I'm out at the library knowing that I have a list of things that I want to look up, that I want to check out books and bring home for, then I do it that way. If I'm in the actual state of writing a scene and I need like, oh, what kind of fish did they eat? you know, at that part of China and that day, what, uh, then I look up because that, that's something that I can find easily online um, and, and fact check it very easily also. So there's all different processes in terms of how I research. Sometimes I sit down and for an hour will just write things out of that I need in terms of, of historical, in terms of how a place was at that time um, and just write down notes and then begin writing. Other times I begin writing and then try to find out what needs to go into that particular scene in terms of researching. Yeah. So back and forth. Yeah. Yes. I, I um, really enjoyed your Samurai's Garden. I think it might be one of your favorite books among the <laughs> My, readers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But I am looking forward to another book set in Japan. And I wondered also if you have many Japanese readers. Do I have Japanese readers in terms of from Japan, in Japan? Well, well you know, I mean, the funny thing is, you know, I'm, I'm, I confuse everybody. I was raised in the Chinese culture. I have a Japanese last name. When I was, and I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, which I thought was, you know, the biggest melting pot of cultures. But I remember when my very first book came out and I was writing about Chinese women, but I had a Japanese last name. And it took, people, even there, a while to kind of figure out what was going on. And I remember being embraced by the Japanese American culture in terms of asking me to speak and everything first, before the Chinese culture. Um, I didn't get the books published in China and, Jap and Japan until two years ago. Um, the books were greatly embraced by the Western European cultures early on. So it's just been within the last couple of years that I think the Chinese and Japanese are actually reading the books in their own language. Um, before I would get emails from Japanese who could read English, um, you know, and I always fall back on the fact that it is fiction because it, ja the Japanese culture is very difficult because it's so honorific. Um, and everything you do means something. So I know that I've made mistakes and I'm, I'm fearful when a real Japanese reads this and says, oh my God. <laughs> but on the, on the other hand, you know, that's where the research comes in where I spend a great deal of time because I'm afraid that I'm making those mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said another book in Japan. The next book is already... Oh. I look at what I'm doing here. I am ping, I'm like a ping pong ball. You know, if you're going to read one in China, you almost are certain the next one is going to be Japan again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have time to read other fiction writers, and if so, any good books that you would recommend? Books, I would, I'm, I'm always reading other fiction writers. I'm one of the few writers, well, I shouldn't say few writers, but I know a lot of my friends don't start writing by reading. I start reading before I start writing sometimes. It's just a good way to get into the rhythm of, of language and words, and I tend to like writers who write lyrically. 
um, who come from poetry backgrounds, because that was my background also. So I start reading everybody. It can be Barbara Kingsolver, who I love. Louise Erdrich is another author that I love. And she has a book coming out, I hear. Um, Ann Patchett. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I'm, I'm, uh, I get a lot of manuscripts, you know, for blurbs and everything, so I tend to have to read those too. Uh, so I probably read all the writers that all of you read, you know. Sometimes I read who's on the New York Times to figure out why they're on the, no. <laughs> why them and not me? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, so really across the board. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I appreciate your comments, but do you use any visual aids like maps or do you use um, Chinese or Japanese language in the books or do you translate them and even the types of foods that they eat there and uh, you know I've been I've read many uh, writers from other cultures and very often I can find myself getting lost in some of the language uh, so I'm wondering if you make it a little bit easier in terms of uh, defining the things that you write about I try to I mean um, that's I'm very conscious of it actually I do put Asian words in to describe things, I hope that I make it clear enough that when you're reading it, you understand what I'm speaking about. You know, like the baba, the mama, instead of mother and father. Um, certainly words that define foods that they eat, I do, and I hope I afterwards tell you it's mustard greens, you know, or whatever. I think I'm very conscious of it, so yes. You use maps. Yes, oh. I use maps because I visually try to figure out where I am. You know what I do a lot? Sometimes when I get writer's block, which I do often, one really good thing, and because I, I started out as a film major, I wanted to be a filmmaker. And a lot of times when I get writer's block, I'll, instead of hitting my head against the laptop, I'll stop and I'll go do something else. And one of the things I do is watch movies. Um, I think it's a really good way of telling a story and to be able to visually see a story being told from one scene to the next scene, the transitions. Well, that's a lot like writing, you know, only it's one step removed. Um, and so I do that a lot. And, and if I'm writing about a period of time, I watch a movie in that period of time to kind of feel how it is then and there. Thank you. So, thank you. One more question? Hi, you really had to work for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a new author, uh -huh. and I wanted to ask you a question. What would you do differently if, uh, what would you do differently to get your first book published? Now that you're, you know, uh, well known. I would write science fiction. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would write comic books, okay. actually. No. <laughs> um, you know, I believe greatly in fate, okay. you know, and I think it's very hard to look back and say, what would I do different now? Because I think I, people always ask, what was your favorite book that you had written? And I always think that every book was written at a time in your life that you had to write that book for whatever reason. Okay. Um, and so I can't imagine doing anything different because I think Women of Silk had to be the first book for some reason. So if, if I could do things differently? <laughs> it's such a hard question again, you know what I mean? Because yes. uh, uh, you have to love what you do. Exactly. And you have to be passionate because if you can't bring the passion forward in yes. the book to the reader, you know, and that's why I think, oh, could I have written more commercial? That's the first thing that comes to my head. Could I have written more commercial? Maybe I would have sold more books, but I don't think... I don't think I would have it in me to do it. So I think that there, you can't really change who you are. Okay. Um, you have to follow your heart always as a writer. If you don't, if you step out of line, you have to know that readers are very intelligent. Readers are good readers. They know when you're not telling the truth. Right. right? So, you know, you always have to tell the truth, whatever that truth is. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. <laughs>